East Africa. And let me introduce the panelists. We have with us Professor Andre Borain. Professor Borain is pro Professor of Law and former Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria. He is on the rules of practicing attorneys and he's an honorary member of South African Rescue Insolvency Practitioners Association, SAPIA in short. Professor Borain served as member of Insol Global Fellowship Program Committee. He's also a member of Insol Academic Forum. Over the years, he has taught variety of subjects and it will be totally right to say that he is an authority on insolvency. I had the first hand experience of reading his books. In 2011, the World Bank appointed, the World Bank appointed Professor Borain as a specialist consultant in conducting ROSC analysis of South African insolvency system. And he served as member of World Bank team in 2013. We also have with us Professor Junaita Kalitz. Professor Kalitz is an associate professor of law at the University of Johannesburg and head of department of mercantile laws, as well as member of UJ Law Dean's Management Committee. She presents undergraduate, postgraduate, and extracurricular courses in insolvency, as well as business rescue, and has represented at national and international conferences. She has written various articles and book chapters, and has co-authored the book, Mars, The Law of Insolvency of South Africa, the 10th edition. It is my pleasure to share with our viewers today that Professor Kalitz, on 1st April 2019, got appointed as chairperson of the Insol Academic Group, and she's a member of Insol Legislative and Regulatory Steering Committee. It's totally an honor for us, Professor Carlitz, to have you with us today. Dr. Eric Levinston, the third panelist with us, he's a director of Worksman Attorney since 1993 and heads the firm's insolvency, business rescue, and restructuring practice. Dr. Levinston is specialist in litigation and dispute resolution with particular focus on business rescue, insolvency, and restructuring, banking finance, and corporate recoveries of debt. His expertise extends to director's liability issues. He regularly delivers seminars and writes various publications on these topics, among others. Dr. Eric Haas is the chairperson of South African Restructuring and Insolvency Practitioners Association and sits on Sarpia's Restructuring, Business Rescue, and Government Liaison Committees. In addition, he's a member of South African Board Representative on Insol International. And it is truly an honor to share with our viewers that Dr. Eric has been ranked as the best lawyers at Insolvency Reorganization Law 2019, and is one of the most recommended lawyers in dispute resolution, business rescue, in Legal 500. It is truly an honor to have three eminent speakers with us. Um, I would like to just brief the viewers uh, that uh, Professor Andre would discuss some problems created by COVID-19 pandemics in context of South Africa. And Professor Khalid would discuss the responses, debt-related responses by the South African government. And Dr. Levenstein would discuss some insolvency in business rescue cases that he had experiences on and the responses from legal practice side. Uh, so without much ado, let me open the panel to uh, Dr. Bo Professor Boring, Dr. Levinston, and Dr. Kalix. Over to you. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Andre Borain, and uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Prof, uh, uh, Dr. Niti for, for the warm welcome and for uh, inviting us to, to present uh, um, at this occasion today. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I just have to inform you as well, uh, uh, like the rest of the world, we in a semi-lockdown now, uh, we had a, a severe lockdown starting on the 26th of March but uh, uh, the lockdown measures are being uh, eased uh, at this uh, point in time, although the infections are climbing at a uh, terrific, if not scary, rate right now. So that is more or less the situation here in South Africa. It's also, of course, winter time, 
and we, we experience quite cold weather uh, right now. So this is the situation here back home, here at my home um, at present. But yes, we are here today and uh, we hope our discussion will, uh, will be a warming uh, in many respects. And um, first and foremost, what we need to do is we need to uh, um, uh, uh, unpack the basics of South African um, uh, insolvency law. So just to give you some background uh, as to uh, what is happening uh, in South Africa, and then we will take it from there. Of course, uh, the essence of our discussion today is uh, to look at um, the impact of COVID-19 on the insolvency laws and practice in South Africa. But before we come to that, we first need to give you uh, a little bit of a structure of South African insolvency law, um, et cetera, so that you can get at least some feeling for, uh, for the subject. And I'm sure all of you are scholars of insolvency law, so I'm quite sure you will pick up what is going on here uh, uh, fairly quickly. So um, just to say, if we start there on, on, on slide one, uh, the background to South African insolvency and rescue law, just to say, like India, uh, our insolvency law is also largely based on, um, on former English laws. Uh, it is also fair to say that the South African insolvency law is currently quite creditor orientated. And the other uh, feature of South African insolvency law is that we have a multiplicity of legislation, meaning that we follow a fragmented approach. Uh, we don't have one unified insolvency act, as is the case uh, in the US uh, of A, for instance, or in the United Kingdom. So we have a multiplicity of legislation dealing with uh, insolvency law. Uh, the main sources of our insolvency law, first and foremost, we have the fairly antiquated Insolvency Act um, of 1936. Uh, and then we also find various insolvency provisions in our company laws. Now, I will explain this in a while, but uh, we have the Companies Act, the current Companies Act of 2008 that came into operation on the 1st of May 2011. And then we have a, a Chapter 14 of the former Companies Act uh, of 1973, but this particular chapter deals with liquidation of companies and it is still in force, and I will explain this in a while. Etc. Uh, of course, the, the effect of, uh, of an insolvency order, uh, be that a liquidation uh, order or a, a sequestration order in terms of our insolvency laws, is that ultimately an estate representative will be appointed and the purpose or the duty of the estate representative will be to maximize and to realize the estate to the benefit of the creditors. That's in essence what this is all about. Of course, in um, um, carrying out his or her duties, the estate representative will have to deal with various aspects uh, in the insolvent estate, uh, like executory contracts, and currently now in the COVID-19 situation, of course, uh, force majeure is also uh, a reality inside and outside insolvency. So this is also an aspect that may have an effect. Then asset tracing is, of course, very important. This is a, a, almost a universal principle. Uh, the state representative must deal with uh, uh, tracing of assets. Uh, and at his or her disposal, he has the doctrine or she has the doctrine of avoidable dispositions. Uh, investigative uh, powers and various other statutory powers to make uh, the asset tracing possible. Then also just to mention, uh, we have a law reform process going on in South Africa, but this process already started in 1987. And uh, one idea is that we will get a unified um, uh, insolvency act, meaning that uh, corporate insolvency and uh, uh, consumer insolvency uh, will be combined in one uh, piece of legislation. Now, as already indicated to you, this process has started in 87 already, but we still don't have the act. So uh, we're still in waiting. And this is also very uh, important for an, uh, for the next topic that I'm going to address. Um, let me just see what happened here. Yeah, I lost my file here. Uh, just give me a moment.
I I think there's a connection uh, drop here. Um, so Professor Borain is reconnecting. Here we go. Thank you, Urbashin. Right, so um, I need to say one or two things more concerning the, uh, the structure of South African insolvency law. Uh, just to say, I already explained to you that we have uh, the Insolvency Act of 1936 and we have uh, uh, the Companies Act of 2008 and linked to the uh, 2008 Companies Act, what is very relevant to uh, to insolvency is the fact that chapter 14 of the 1973 Companies Act still applies. So I just want to say something about that before we move on uh, with South African Business Rescue. So uh, first and foremost, uh, if we look at um, Uh, there's a drop again. Um. order is that Advantage to creditors is a statutory requirement. I already explained to you that our system is still pretty much uh, uh, creditor uh, uh, orientated. Then uh, an individual or natural person can be rehabilitated in terms of our, uh, our insolvency act. Uh, it's not a very liberal uh, rehabilitation process, but uh, it does provide the natural person or the individual with a discharge in relation to pre-sequestration debt. I also just want to point out that we also have pre-sequestration procedures in South Africa. Uh, uh, in other words, some debt relief measures that individuals may use outside the ambit of formal insolvency law. So we have, for instance, uh, debt review, we have debt administration, and of course we have voluntary debt Yeah, I think uh, Professor Borain is reconnecting. There could be some network issue from that end. My apologies for that. Uh, this is being recorded and uh, it should be available to uh, on our YouTube channel. But uh, I think it should be fine in a few minutes. Just going on. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a good suggestion. Uh, when he joins, let me request Professor Borain to switch off his camera. I think that will better his connectivity.
um, so just to uh, share with the viewers uh, while this about it connects that uh, discussion uh, will also be featured on YouTube and also on a website we're coming with a report or whatever we discuss uh, right now we've been able to release only one report but uh, very soon Boston, we'll be able to the yeah, Professor yes. Bore, can I suggest you? You may uh, switch off Sorry? your video. Maybe if you switch off the video, it may be. You. If you could switch Sorry. off the video. It is now, can you? I think he is disconnected again. Uh, should, can I request some other speaker, Professor Khalid's or Dr. Levinston, to? Hello. Well, yes. Yeah. I think um, I can continue. Okay, so if we look at the structure of South African insolvency law, I think the first thing that we all need to realize is that we have a due process in place. And that means that we simply have a due regulatory as well as a due statutory process where we work with different pieces of legislation depending on whether you are working with an individual or a company. So our Companies Act would actually speak to our winding up procedures and our liquidation and also the business rescue procedures, our restructuring uh, regime um, is included in that Companies Act that we 2008 Companies Act. And then when you look at your um, insolvency for um, uh, consumers, as well as your corporate insolvency, your formal procedures for your uh, corporate um, for your company, you will then turn to your Insolvency Act. So in that sense, we do have a dual process. As you can see, Professor Bahrain, um, I'm not sure if he can hear us or see us. Andre? Let me speak with him uh, separately and try to fix the uh, problem. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to continue with the business rescue um, framework or regime. Sure. Um, Andre, are you there? <laughs> I can faintly hear you. You can continue Hello, with the business. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can can you can you hear me? I don't know that yes. the sound uh, keeps on coming and going on my side. I don't know what's going on. Um, okay. Right. Just proceed with the business rescue. I finished the okay. um, previous slides. Okay. So sorry for that. I've, uh, it's a technical issue here. South African business rescue. Well, thank you, Anita, for for uh, uh, for continuing with that slide of mine. But the South African business rescue. Uh, this is a fairly new development in South African law. Well, we used to have judicial management. Now, uh, it was agreed basically that that was an ineffective uh, business rescue procedure. And as from the 1st of May 2011, when the 2008 Companies Act came into operation, uh, as you will recall in my earlier uh, um, uh, <coughs> uh, discussion, uh, we also got this new South African Business Rescue Procedure. It forms part of the uh, uh, 2008 Companies Act, and it is regulated by our Chapter 6. So uh, where the Americans have the Chapter 11, we have the Chapter 6 uh, uh, Business Rescue Procedure. Uh, just in brief, this particular procedure is initiated by the, uh, by the resolution of a board or by means of a court order. And the test is basically when the company experiences financial distress, then it can be put into a formal state of business rescue. So what are the aims of business rescue in South African insolvency law? Well, the idea is to maximize the likelihood to continue on a solvent basis, or if this is not possible, to render a better return for creditors than what they would get in liquidation. Of course, if the business rescue is not feasible, then the company should be liquidated. 
The person responsible for carrying out uh, the business rescue and practice is called the business rescue practitioner or the BRP. He or she takes control uh, 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 of the company, but the directors remain in place, but they will report to the BRP. What's also very important is we have a statutory moratorium and automatic stay if you want. That starts with the commencement of business rescue. And what is important about this, the creditors will not be able to institute civil claims or execute against the company if they, are, uh, they have already uh, um, got uh, court orders against the company. So in essence, that is what the statutory moratorium is about. It's a very strong moratorium. So what is the main duty of uh, the business rescue practitioner to consider the various options of the company to recover, to develop a business rescue plan that must ultimately be approved by the creditors. In his or her dealings with the company, the business rescue pr practitioner will also have to deal with executory contracts, contracts of leases, sale, etc. The business rescue pr um, uh, practitioner may suspend uh, some of these contracts in full or in part, or with a court order, may even terminate some of these contracts. But Contracts of employment, very important in South Africa. Contracts of employment will in principle continue after the business res uh, uh, rescue uh, has commenced. And uh, suffice to say that our um, employees have very strong uh, rights in this particular um, dispensation. Just also to note, we have also the section 155 compromise with creditors. Uh, this is a separate procedure that can also be used uh, to rescue a company, but it also forms part of chapter six uh, of our Companies Act. Then to come back to the COVID, what this discussion is all about, just to say in brief by way of introduction, our legislature did not respond by introducing new or amendments to our insolvency uh, measures as such. Uh, there are some government relief initiatives and uh, Professor Collins will discuss those. And then there's also some private sector relief, um, repayment holidays, etc. What is giving some uh, problems in the South African dispensation is uh, force majeure. Of course, we had a lot of th that, but I think that is a, a, a global issue right now. Um, and then just to say, uh, as far as the global responses are concerned, Professor Collins also uh, drafted the South African bid for the World Bank stroke uh, insol um, guide on the measures uh, adopted uh, globally. And uh, she will take you through that. Then um, views from private practice, of course, it's really the people in private practice that feel the brunt of what is happening with our insolvency laws, etc. And Dr. Eric Levenstein will elaborate on various aspects concerning that. So uh, in a nutshell, I gave you the overview of uh, about, um, our insolvency laws and the business rescue dispensation. I apologize for this technical glitch that I got with uh, uh, with the slides from my side and uh, the sound disappearing. But uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Collins, for uh, for continuing. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Professor Collins. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm going to do a short introduction and then I'm going to continue. So um, as Professor Berain mentioned, uh, the international spread of this virus does not only have far reaching consequences from a social perspective, um, but it's also crippling the global economy. And as a result, governments worldwide are responding with a combination of legal and economic and financial measures. So this global financial crisis is confronting emerging market economies with a double blow. As it brings along sudden halt in capital inflows, it also shows a dramatic decline in export demand associated with the slump. And not to mention the disruption in supply chains um, due to the lockdown conditions. So it goes without saying that um, SMEs 
have been the hardest hit. And, and from an emerging market perspective, I think you would agree with me, SMEs are the engines, the engine of our economy that keeps it moving forward. So the F effect on SMEs is especially severe, um, particularly because of the high levels of vulnerability and the lower resilience uh, related to their size. And given the limited resources um, of SMEs and existing obstacles um, in um, accessing capital, um, the period which SMEs can survive the shock um, is far more restricted. So in recent weeks, several international organizations have issued studies on aspects of the economic of the virus, and I can refer you to the World Bank and Insol Global Guides, it's available on the Insol website. But the IMF has also published a number of reflections um, uh, and on the expected effect on policies required in particular. And these highlight, interestingly, compared to the 2008 global finance financial crisis, that this time around the decline in services appears much greater, um, especially in urban settings. So um, according to the IMF, um, under the assumption that the pandemic and required containment peaks in the second quarter for most countries, although I think that will not include Africa, and recedes in the second half, um, in April, they projected the global growth in 2020 to fall by minus 3%. So this is a downgrade of 6.3 percentage points. Um, now, if we stand still um, in South Africa, um, the president announced a national lockdown on the 26th of March. However, on the 27th of March, the rating agency Moody's also downgraded South Africa to junk status. So this created the perfect storm for our economic down, down spiral. So let's see um, what emergency measures have been implemented by government and as Andre mentioned, the short answer is none. Um, concessions have been made by um, our regulators or companies, the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, CIPC, and Eric will speak to that. Um, but then we've also had certain, um, certain funding schemes initiatives um, by government. For instance, your debt relief um, fund is a business growth facility fund. They've um, also introduced a solidarity response fund. Um, and there they managed to raise about 1.7 billion rand from corporates, from individuals who donated money. But this um, Solidarity Response Fund will focus um, on health responses, hearing issues, and on driving this campaign to mobilize and motivate citizens um, to, to, to actually donate to this particular fund. So there's also been some legislative reforms on the periphery impacting on stakeholders dealing with companies in financial distress. And if we just look at employees, we see that there's a, a relief scheme um, that has been established to pay employers with paying salaries and wages. Um, if we look at the lenders, as far as the measures employed, um, the government has um, requested banking industry to continue to ex um, extend credit to certain sectors, and then particular to household and smaller businesses. And then there's also been some assistance to SMEs in particular um, by way of a government's loan guarantee scheme um, as, as an initiative uh, to provide loans to SMEs guaranteed by government. Um, to businesses with an annual turnover of less than 300 million rand. So funds borrowed through the scheme can be used for operational expenses and such as salaries and rent and lease agreements, etc. But if we look at all these uh, initiatives, it is clear that most of government as well as private sector initiatives are focusing on debt relief and bailout plans. Um, and we could ask ourselves the question, how relieving is debt relief, as it could plug the holes only for so long. So, so what? Um, if we ask ourselves, 
why insolvency law? Um, why am I uh, uh, um, discussing um, insolvency law at the moment? So we all know that internationally there's a general recognition that efficient and effective insolvency systems are an essential part of the financial design needed to underpin investment and economic growth. And I think we will all agree that in these um, economic conditions at the moment, that becomes very relevant from an emerging market perspective. Um, in 2015, um, the Vice President, Senior Vice President of the World Bank Group described this um, principle very aptly, um, that a well-designed legal and regulatory framework with respect to insolvency and data credit rights facilitate the extension of credit and enable private sector development. So the availability of credit is obviously a key driver of economic activity by providing for the restructuring and preservation of distressed yet viable businesses, but also alternatively for the orderly exit of non-viable businesses. Insolvency laws offer, first of all, predictability and also enhance investor confidence as a result. So overall, the transparency and efficiency of these insolvency systems have a direct impact on the allocation of credit and risk management. So there's also been numerous studies by the World Bank which gives us a link um, or that provides the link um, if, um, between effective insolvency reform measures and it links it with a lower cost and an increased access to credit. And one of the, the examples would then be the ease of doing business initiatives. So, what are the most critical concerns and challenges um, that have arisen um, in South Africa? Well, for me, the first challenge would be the lack of focused effort by government uh, to address the fallout from the crisis, and especially um, from a restructuring and liquidation standpoint. So the relief efforts by government should be commended. However, as a step two, government could now be improving the credit environments through the development of a more effective insolvency system. So this will assist in saving businesses, but also allowing failed businesses to exit the market efficiently. Ultimately, this increases the return to stakeholders um, from NPLs, reduces dependency on the courts, and it saves jobs through the preservation of enterprise value um, via restructuring. Now, up to present, as we mentioned, there will be no indication that these special emergency measures are forthcoming. A second challenge would be the inability of our existing um, insolvency legislation to provide adequate response. So as already mentioned, this economic shock um, will devastate local businesses. And it is imperative that these companies in financial distress contemplate their continued existence um, and consider business rescue as the appropriate restructuring tool. South Africa already has a robust and effective business rescue regime. And we've come a long way since the early days when our courts were flooded with interpretation issues. But we can still do a lot more to promote this process as a restructuring tool in this economic climate. I have to stress, however, that business rescue proceedings, in the words of one of our judges, are, for the, are not for the terminally ill company, nor are they for the chronically ill. They are for the ailing company, which given time will be rescued and become solvent. So it is therefore inevitable that certain companies will not be able to weather the storm and will be forced into formal liquidation proceedings. The current legislation and institutional framework dealing with corporate insolvency is, however, hopelessly outdated and inadequate to deal with the disruption caused by this pandemic. And this raises huge concerns about the capacity 
of our system to cope with the unexpected numbers that we will be seeing um, without extraordinary government intervention. And then a third challenge that I want to highlight is that uh, is the inadequate institutional framework. So we all know that there is a relation between the institutional and regulatory environment versus economic growth. It is also globally expected that value is destroyed, exposed as a result of the inability of a system to quickly save viable businesses and to reallocate the assets of non-viable businesses um, towards a more productive activity. As such, the role of our courts as well as our regulators as lawmakers and law enforcement institutions has become more important in most developing jurisdictions. So within this corporate insolvency law context, we have the master of the high court that has the supervising and administration powers in the South Africa insolvency law. And on the other side, we do have CIPC in charge of the com company law framework and business rescue. Again, highlighting the dual framework that we inherited. Now, both the courts, the master and CIPC were at a stage running at a reduced service. And the master is currently also only rendering certain emergency services. Um, certain protocols have been um, uh, 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 published um, and as a result of the lockdown and as a result of COVID, um, it has really hampered the administration process of insolvency um, uh, estates. So apart from the fallout from the pandemic, there will then obviously be an enormous backlog to deal with. And the biggest challenge in my view has been the lack of a stout institutional framework to mitigate the consequences. If we ask ourselves the question, why hasn't there been any response? And I think most of you now sort of ask that question. Um, I can't give you a clear answer. I can only really give you my own um, opinion on, on, on this particular point. And I think, the first would be the dual regulatory and legislative systems that are in place. So you're dealing with two different government uh, departments, and that already makes coordination and communication very murky. It should also be noted that both the master, which acts as a regulator in insolvency law, as well as CIPC, which acts as a regulator in company law, are not authentic regulators in the sense that they do not have any powers to develop policy or become involved in lawmaking. If we compare this to example the role that the insolvency service policy team played now in delivering the corporate insolvency and governance bill, um, we realize that that is a shortcoming in our insolvency um, framework and regime. So the insolvency service, in order to enable the book to be put on the statute's books in a record time, engaged extensively with liaison committees, um, with the official opposition, with um, business retail, um, with trade unions and the insolvency profession. But the point I want to make is that they played a key role in facilitating the law reform process. Contrary to that, South Africa do not have in the insolvency law context have a well-oiled and law reform process that could be unlocked to produce this kind of emergency measure. So what responses would I um, suggest? Uh, what policy responses? And I can only give you my wish list. Um, the first point I want to make is that we should keep it simple. Now would not be the time to overdo or overthink this. And it's very difficult for an academic to do that, by the way. So first on my wish list would be for a task team and a ministerial task team to be appointed to investigate, but more importantly, to coordinate 
these can bring some policy and law reform measures. We still need to think through the policy development process. Um, we can't just only introduce emergency measures without this process. However, it should it should be done speedily and and uh, in record time. So the measures that I would recommend, um, first of all, would be to create a special purpose institutional framework. And normal restructuring procedures or in some procedures may not be fast or effective enough to address this widespread financial distress. But very importantly, from an emerging market perspective, the minute that you refer to regulatory uh, regimes, the cost of establishing and maintaining this institutional framework should be weighed against the benefits of providing that system. There should be a balance between the effective and efficient system uh, in which the public has confidence and the cost involved. So the need for this well-functioning system cannot be overemphasized. Um, about nine years ago, I looked at and um, suggested that we look at the official receiver model in corporate insolvency in South Africa. Um, a role that has been operated in UK and Australia for, um, for personal bankruptcies for over 100 years. And we do not have to reinvent wheels. Another suggestion or recommendation would be to, to, to promote out-of-court proceedings um, as a way to avoid insolvency um, systems altogether if we identify the, the capacity of these systems as a challenge. I would also suggest that we provide for a standalone moratorium that will not necessarily tie in um, and will not serve as a gateway to any specific insolvency proceeding. It will act as a temporary measure uh, to restrict the aggressive actions of creditors at this moment. I would also um, introduce a lower threshold um, for entering the business rescue process. And this can be done very easily by an amendment to the definition of business rescue and the criteria to be applied by courts and directors. It would make business rescue more accessible to businesses, and that is important and relevant. And then, um, this has now been written about um, and, and uh, motivated widely, is a special uh, stuff, um, small medium enterprise framework, SME framework. And again, I can refer you to the, um, the work that the World Bank has done on this particular um, um, topic. So, insolvency law should be designed to provide a simple and cost effective response to the particular features and problems of SMEs. So, historically, insolvency systems have been designed with larger enterprises in mind. And this is why, especially in emerging markets, um, we have to rethink this process. Um, in 2017, there was a paper published um, in, in, um, in, in public domain by a group, the Bowen Island Group. It consists of um, a few academics and it, I, would, I would actually um, recommend that you read this paper because it deals with SMEs and, and insolvency law and makes very valuable um, suggestions. Um, particularly, they suggest this um, modular approach. Um, and the modular approach shares with standard insolvency regimes the core objectives, objectives of pres um, pres pres um, preserving and maximizing the value of the insolvent estate. So, other than that, I would also, last but not least, um, motivate and, and request that we review or create policy and legislation which will enable the fourth industrial revolution, 4IR. As a result of this crisis, um, there's an urgent need to implement technology 
in the area of insolvency proceedings. And I know 4IR is a much wider concept than simply implementing technology. Um, but this would be a start. Utilization of technology will enable the reduction of costs of proceedings, and it will expedite the process. Um, an example would be to make provision for online creditor meetings um, and online filing systems. Um, this has already been successfully implemented by the South African courts. I would, however, have a, a caveat here in that you should guide against the migration of system um, simply for the sake of it um, without a well thought through reform process. The legislation should also speak to your innovations. Then, if I can conclude, um, keep it simple. Uh, we do not want to create an uh, implementation gap between the law in the books and the law in action. Um, whatever regulatory and statutory measures we develop and introduce should be clear, straightforward and digestible for a director or individual sitting in their living space, in their um, uh, study, talking to their fellow directors about a cash flow problem. They need to understand the system and it should be something that they can relate to. Um, they currently exist an urgent need to supplement existing processes um, and, and, and rules that already exist. Um, and these insolvency and insolvency related reforms need, however, to be accompanied by a more comprehensive package of legal and institutional reform. If I can just end this by saying that the key to the impact of any legislation will always lie in its implementation. Thank you. I hope um, I can deal with your questions a bit later. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Kalitz. Now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Levinson to please take the discussion forward. Thank you. Um, I hope you can see me. Um, I wanted to first thank uh, Dr. Niti for inviting us and my colleagues Andre and Juanita. It's an absolute pleasure to join you this afternoon. I am an attorney in private practice here in Santon, um, Johannesburg, and I want to share with you some of the exposures that I've had in private practice to the fallout from COVID-19 in um, what has been a very tough time not just in South Africa, but I'm sure in India as well. So firstly, thanks for the invitation, and I'm going to go through some of the issues that have arisen in practice um, in, in the last couple of months. So we've been in lockdown, as Andre said, for three months, uh, and it's had a marked effect on our economy. Um, most companies in South Africa are on, are on what we call a knife edge of financial distress. And really the lockdown, uh, as I'm sure it has globally, has seriously affected the ability to trade uh, companies, businesses, where uh, there's been basically no revenue generation at all. And unfortunately, these businesses have continued overhead costs, salaries and wages to pay, um, landlords to pay, uh, creditors and suppliers to pay. So there's been a lot of pressure placed on these companies. In South Africa, we have seen um, fallout across the board, and it really is what we say industry agnostic. It, it affects everybody across the board. I'm just over here. Uh, sorry, that was my my Siri my Siri oh. talking to me. Um, we we have um, seen fallout in the hospitality industry, uh, restaurant industry, the travel sector, the airline industry, which I'll come back to in a minute, uh, the beauty salon industry, and the hairdressing industry uh, in a large way. And in fact, today they've just announced some relaxation in those last two categories. The retail sector, shopping malls, we've seen a marked decrease in people um, spending money. The foot traffic in, in our shopping malls has dropped off quite dramatically. So directors of companies that are struggling in South Africa have three options. You either 
go through what we call an informal restructuring, uh, or you would go through a formal restructuring, as Juanita has set out, a business rescue process, or alternatively, the fallback position or the default position would be liquidation or bankruptcy. And the test really is financial distress. The board needs to sit down and take a view as to whether or not in the next six month period, will the company be able to pay its debts? If not, then you will have to look at a business rescue filing. Um, and really the six month window has been built into our legislation specifically to allow a window where at least you'll be able to file for rescue, appoint a supervisor and try get some restructuring done, which would deliver a better deal for creditors than they would get in a liquidation. So there's two outcomes to business rescue. One is the company continues to trade on a restructured basis after the supervisor has filed the plan, the plan's been approved, and the plan gets implemented. And that is what we are seeing, I would say, to a large extent in South Africa at the moment, and I'll get to some case examples shortly. Um, of course, the, the other option is an informal restructuring. The problem is you can appoint a chief restructuring officer or an expert in informal restructuring. The problem, of course, is that there is no moratorium or stay on claims. So even though you might be doing a workout or trying to talk to your creditors, staving off um, inevitable summonses and actions and applications for winding up, the problem, of course, is no official statutory moratorium. So in, informal restructuring is a challenge. Um, most companies in South Africa, and we're seeing an increase now, um, relates to filing for business rescue. Of course, the, the the test is, is there a reasonable prospect of rescuing the company? And that's something which the board's got to deliberate over, as well as the practitioner who gets appointed, because in a very short time period, he's got to go back to the creditors at the first meeting of creditors and say, yes, I think this company does have an option. Uh, it can be restructured, whether it's creditors, suppliers, it's contracts, um, maybe a, a reorganization uh, of management and the board will deliver up a better deal than you'd get in liquidation. And that really is the deliberation that boards and companies are going through right now at the moment in South Africa. Of course, if there's no reasonable prospect of rescue, then you're looking at a liquidation or an insolvency, which is not a good outcome because, at, you know, as we've, we've really heard today, the, the ultimate up, downside there is jobs are lost completely across the board. And really, it's the end of the life of the company. So the advantages really of business rescue is the moratorium on creditor claims, as well as the ability to get a breathing space, to restructure the company and get to a position where hopefully the company can trade into the future um, with uh, its creditor suppliers and with its management. In South Africa, we've seen a lot of companies through the lockdown, go into what we call a mothball position. In other words, just shut everything down. Let's not trade. Let's wait to see what happens after the um, the lockdown is lifted. And as has been alluded to already, we have seen some lifting of the lockdown. We started at level five, which was extreme and very much uh, a countrywide lockdown. We've moved to level four, and now we're at level three, where there is has been some lifting in the economy. Um, where most businesses are starting to go back on a, on a pretty slow basis, but they are starting to go back. So the other issue which I want to talk about is what Andre mentioned briefly, is the reliance on the force majeure clause, which has been interesting in practice. So for example, a tenant of a building will say, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Landlord, we can't afford to pay my rental because we just aren't trading, there's no revenue. Please give us uh, some form of payment holiday. Uh, let's see if we can work it out over a period. Now, most businesses um, have got some form of leniency, whether it's from their landlords or from their suppliers or from their creditors. But the danger, of course, is that if that continues, there's always the threat of someone coming along and bringing an application for the bankruptcy or the liquidation of the company. So it's a, a very high risk game that we're seeing in practice where companies just say, well, it's a force majeure. There's a supervening impossibility of performance. We can't generate revenue through our business and therefore let's just not pay our debts. Very dangerous and can end up in liquidation. One of the other interesting aspects, which uh, I think Juanita spoke about, is what's been going on with our courts. Uh, I think our courts generally, because of the hardship of the lockdown, are bending over backwards not to put companies into liquidation, but rather to uh, consider business rescue as an option. Um, 
we have seen uh, courts give rulings historically that the, the intention of our legislation is to balance the rights and interests of all stakeholders. And South Africa, uh, in particular, looks at employees' rights and preserving jobs. And that really is a driver when it comes to court applications and judgments that we've seen over the last few years, um, in the, particularly in the business rescue space. Um, online court hearings are the norm. Uh, I had a recent five judge of appeal hearing on Zoom um, a couple of weeks ago. It went off very, very well. Uh, and we had some um, interesting debate over um, the, the virtual platforms, which is quite interesting. Um, just directors, obviously, in a very risk, uh, risky position because they are potentially opening themselves up to training on insol in insolvent circumstances. And what we did see um, is the company's office, what we call SIPSI, uh, come along and provide some form of relaxation to the uh, threat of directors being sued for reckless trading. And they um, put out a notice um, around about, I think it was in March of this year, where they talked about uh, a moratorium on prosecutions for reckless trading. But unfortunately, that was only um, something which would prohibit the uh, company's office from um, pr prosecuting directors for reckless trading, but not third-party creditors. So even though there was some um, softening of uh, that position, directors would be very uh, foolhardy and it would be very dangerous for them to rely on that relaxation because third-party creditors who are not being paid and where directors trade their companies recklessly with an intention potentially to fraud creditors uh, or on a negligent basis in terms of Section 22 of our Companies Act, they might very well be sued for reckless trading. And that is something which obviously creates an anxiety where directors would rather file for the protection of business rescue. Um, so reckless trading is very real. I think there's a lot of pressure on South African boards um, to consider what their position is. Uh, they do have, a, as I said earlier, a six-month window to establish whether or not there's a need to file for business rescue. Um, case studies, we've seen a lot of movement in the airline industry. We've seen South African Airways um, go through a very long period of restructuring, which ultimately in December last year ended up in business rescue. Um, yesterday, they put forward their business rescue plan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was not approved. Um, the unions, the trade unions, and a lot of creditors were not happy with the details set out in that plan, and that has been postponed now for further deliberation for the next two weeks. And I think on the 14th of July, that plan will go back to the vote. Uh, it's been a very difficult um, workout because the shelter is government. I don't think government wants to see South African Airways fail, but we will see whether or not the plan, which was published, can be uh, re um, redrafted or amended in a way which makes both the unions and creditors happier. Um, the other very big finding in the airline industry is Comair Limited, which operates British Airways uh, and a, and a, a uh, discount airline called Kalula in South Africa. They're in business rescue. They recently announced that there is an investor looking at their position and hopefully that will land in a plan which allows that company uh, as an airline to continue flying probably much later in the year um, just because at the moment demand to fly in South Africa is at a very low level, even though government is allowing people to fly for business reasons. So that's been very interesting. We've seen a lot of work um, from a practice perspective in the airline space. We've also seen a filing in the retail space, a company called Edcon. Um, they had their plan approved this week as well. Uh, and we've also seen in the horse racing industry, um, a, a, a large enterprise called Kumalela go into business rescue. So you can see it's a very dynamic and busy area of the law. It's certainly keeping lawyers like myself busy and my colleagues at other law firms. Um, just, um, just to say that our courts have been involved in the COVID period, looking at the rights of employees in sp in specifically. Um, for example, there was a, um, an interdict brought uh, to stop a certain retrenchment process in the SAA business rescue. And we've also seen in the Mazepoli case, which is a restaurant that went into business rescue, some deliberation over the rights of employees and whether they have locus standi, where they can't go to work and where they say, even though they can't go to work, they have a right to bring an application 
to place a company into business rescue. So to wrap up, um, the road ahead uh, does look um, difficult, and I'm sure the same applies in India and globally across the world. I don't think personally we're going to see um, an uptick in the economies, uh, particularly in the South African economy, until probably the end of the year, if not early in the new year. And again, as I said earlier, this place has continued pressure on directors um, going forward. Is there an upside? I think there is an opportunity to reset businesses, businesses that probably needed a fresh start or some form of restructuring. Um, we've certainly seen um, companies that probably would have gone into business rescue anyway, file for business rescue in this COVID period. And there certainly has been an increase in the filings for business rescue, um, as I said earlier. Um, I do think more and more companies will grab the opportunity to not pay creditors and get the benefit of the moratorium or the stay of claims as things go on. Um, and I think just my own personal views, I think the global economy and particularly in South Africa, we work, we are walking a tightrope uh, and you just don't want to fall over uh, into uh, or over and into a cliff of, of financial failure and, and liquidations in mass because that would be extremely dangerous for the economies, for workers and for, and for jobs and for the preservation of what clearly are in the most uh, very good businesses. So just to wrap up, I think we're all facing unprecedented times in practice. Um, most South African companies are going uh, through a very hard um, inward looking search uh, financially and operationally. Um, I don't think it's going to alleviate in the short term, but Maybe if we have the same conversation in January, things will look a lot more positive. So from a practice perspective, that's where I'd like to uh, leave it. Thank, thank you, Dr. Niti. Thank you, uh, Dr. Levinson. Uh, now, I request audience, if you have any questions, you could put it in the chat box here. You could either direct it to one of the panelists, or in case you want to leave it open to all, you could let us know. Uh, till we get questions from the audience, uh, I have one question. Uh, I leave it to either Professor Khaled or Dr. Levinston or Dr. Borain to answer. Uh, uh, as we understand that uh, there is not uh, any legislative policy intervention right now uh, in South Africa to deal with the COVID. Um, so what are the current uh, current scheme that you have either within companies at or outside where uh, you know probably practitioners could develop or uh, uh, you know redesign the business rescue regime to help the companies um well, need you, do you want to have a go and then i'm happy to follow I hope I got all of that. Sorry, my audio is now doing the same as Andre's audio. Um, so you're asking us whether we do have a process um, in place that would speak to um, in, uh, uh, amendments to our Companies Act. Is that did I did I catch that? No, I I wanted to know what are the uh, current schemes that you have within law which could be used uh, for restructuring or for bu uh, business rescue. Okay. Oh, all right. No, we do have a section 155 scheme that is built into our Companies Act, and I think um, uh, 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 Eric will be able to actually also give us more or less an indication of how successful that scheme is being used in practice. Um, and then we also, obviously, as as we all mentioned, we have the business rescue. Um, but other than that. You have then on the spectrum of insolvency, you've got your out of court informal restructurings, you've got your formal restructuring business rescue, and then you move on to your formal winding up procedures. Other than that, the informal um, uh, the regime is, is very lively at the moment um, between the banks and creditors. Um, but, but again, it, it speaks to the moratorium and the availability of a moratorium. Um, and that's where my suggestion came in with um, actually an emergency measure for a standalone moratorium um, at the moment that is not connected to any other insolvency or restructuring procedures. Eric, um, um, so, Dr. Nisi, from my side, I mean, we I spoke earlier about the informal restructuring space. So, what happened when COVID-19 created our lockdown? 
Uh, most companies couldn't trade. So they went into what we almost called a quasi moratorium, almost like an informal moratorium where people couldn't go to court in any event to apply for the company's bankruptcy or liquidation. Uh, but applying for business rescue itself was a challenge. Uh, and there was some uncertainty whether or not the company's office would in fact take in resolutions for business rescue. So we went through to about two months of almost an informal moratorium where people, as I said earlier, were trying to get leniency, payment holidays, uh, some form of informal moratorium from their creditors. And that worked quite well, but then obviously we started opening up uh, early June and now our courts are operating. So it's very difficult now for creditors um, just to say, well, you know, we'll give you a, a few more months or whatever it might be. They are also under financial constraint. And therefore, the, the difficulty is that if you don't then file for formal rescue protection with, as Juanita says, the moratorium, it becomes a very dangerous game because your creditor could put you into liquidation or bankruptcy. So at the moment, it really is all about business rescue. Uh, reading the newspapers every day, I've never seen such a uh, an increase in the numbers of companies filing for business rescue both at the sme level and at the larger level and i think as pressure starts to increase over the next few months when there's going to be a catch-up after the lockdown period we're going to see further filings for business rescue as well the 155 process is really a scheme of arrangement again there's no moratorium so we have not seen a proliferation of that happening at all uh, again, business rescue being the flavor of the month. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there's another question we have from the audience, Mr. Pulkit Devra. He's an uh, insolvency lawyer in India, a very noted one, and also a visiting faculty to GIP. He asks a question. Should the panel perhaps talk about the kind of three insolvency schemes introduced? And a follow-up question he has is, Recognition of free insolvency schemes in cross-border insolvency. So if any panelists would like to take up the question. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, pre-insolvency schemes, um, we, we do not have any pre-insolvency schemes that are currently um, in, in um, being recognized. Um, I can ask Professor Varone if he is uh, now on the call. Um, on our cross-border insolvency law, we have a very interesting and unique situation in South Africa, which again speaks to my point of a law reform process that is simply not actually working at the moment. I can just tell you that we do have a cross-border insolvency act on our books. However, it is not in operation at the moment for the simple reason that we have a reciprocity clause included in our insolvency and cross-border insolvency act so we in, in, whereby the minister needs to actually do across a, you know a tick box exercise um to to acknowledge and recognize certain jurisdictions um for the cross-border insolvency act so what happens at the moment is we fall back on our common common law when we deal with cross-border insolvency law so you have to apply to courts for the recognition of any procedures insolvency wise as well as the appointment of your insolvency representatives um i think professor Varain is Back. Um, I just mentioned our insolvency, cross-border insolvency law regime at the moment, um, which is a bit, um, and, and that again makes the law unclear. And that is not, when you deal with investors, when you deal with an emerging market um, who wants to grow the economy, it's not ideal. You need transparent, you need clear um, indication of, of what the legislation is that um, is available in your jurisdiction. So if I can just summarize, in my opinion, um, you have a very strong restructuring um, regime. Our business rescue seems to be working. Yes, we have teething problems here and there. We have got litigation going on. But I think the South African Airways is a very um, good case study for us to actually look at our at our legislation um, and see what the pitfalls and problems are. One of the process or projects that I am um, busy with at the moment is doing research 
on sector related processes where I actually um, looking at the idea of developing specific sector related uh, frameworks within our business rescue um, regime, which would probably then deal with mining and retail and aviation, etc. Um, because of the unique challenges that you experience when you deal with aviation regarding your licenses, when you deal with your mining, your, your environmental issues, um, your retail becomes your, your, your um, uh, uh, lease contracts, etc., etc. Okay, I'm now talking too much. Um, but anyway, that is something that I'm interested in and uh, yeah, um, I, I have my email address at the end of our PowerPoint slides. Um, you can address any questions or anything that I refer to, um, I would make it available and um, our PowerPoint slide will also be made available. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, would um, other panelists like to add to that or should we move to the next question? So uh, there's one more, yeah, Dr. Levinston, would you like to add? No, um, I, I agree with Juanita. I think that uh, we do have uh, sound legislation for restructuring in South Africa. Um, we have been with our business due legislation now for 11 years odd. Uh, and yes, we did have teething problems, a lot of case law, a lot of learnings, but I think it's found traction um, and it really comes down to stakeholder buy-in buy and what they call the circle of acceptance, that people need to understand they need to be compromised on claims, they have to work together with the business rescue practitioner to make sure the company survives. So I think that's the sentiment we're seeing in South Africa at the moment. Very interesting. Uh, if audience don't have any questions, there's one question that has come up which is totally unrelated to the, to the uh, discussion we're having right now, but nevertheless, uh, one of the uh, uh, GIP student wants to know, how business rescue practitioners are regulated in South Africa and the duties and if you could throw some light on duties and remuneration. Now what he means by remuneration is that is remuneration market driven or restricted by the government? Uh, I'm happy to start with that. Um, business rescue practitioners have to be licensed um, at what we call SIPSI, our company's office. And they've also got to belong to an accredited organization. Um, I, I am the chair of a, of a group called Seripa, the South African Restructuring Association. We have other um, organizations like the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, etc., that you need to belong to in order to get a license from SIPSI. Uh, you've also got to be in good standing with your organization and obviously be someone um, that can do a restructuring and have the experience to do it. There's various grades of practitioners. We have senior, experienced, and junior practitioners. Um, we have a, probably about 400 in the country, um, odd. Um, we are obviously working hard to get more practitioners involved in taking the license or getting the, the license done. I think we need to talk to the examinations that are available in a minute. Um, and the other interesting uh, question that was raised now is remuneration. There's a tariff that's set out in the regulations to the Act which talks about um, what practitioners are entitled to get paid per hour uh, or per day, depending on the size of the company. Um, most practitioners are accredited to up that rate slightly, um, depending on the size of the company and how involved the business rescue process actually is. But we do um, have some very in, uh, very important courses and um, university courses that perhaps Juanita can just speak to quickly. Uh, yes. Um if you go to Sarepo's website, um, and I will give the link just now, they actually indicate to you what programs, courses um, are available in South Africa. Um, at the moment, what is interesting, again, that I mentioned in, 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 in my discussion, is our dual regulatory process. Um, you have the same group of individuals uh, dealing with both corporate insolvency, your formal winding up process, your um, and then the same group of individuals 
dealing with business risk, you're acting as business risk practitioners. Although the regulation of these group of individuals is done by two separate regulators. Um, so it's a very costly exercise that, that we experience at the moment. And as I say, um, hampering law reform, in my opinion, as we need to communicate with two different government departments um, and we need to actually get clarity on, on the law reform process um, from various um, uh, different in, uh, departments at the moment. Um, but yes, I'll just give you the, the link uh, where you can find these programs that are available at the moment. Thank you so much uh, for the answer. Now that we don't have any further questions and we have exceeded our time, uh, would each panelist like to just have last words to speak? Like, to summarize. Let, let me just see. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, so uh, apologies again for this audio thing, but uh, sometimes uh, technology is not as good as it's supposed to be. Just a few remarks from my side. Uh, as we already uh, explained, uh, we have, a, 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 I think we have a fairly strong insolvency uh, a legislative structure in South Africa, but clearly it is outdated. We need to modernize our system in some respects. Uh, maybe this uh, COVID emergency situation will actually spur our legislature uh, on in time to introduce some new uh, uh, urgently needed measures. But uh, 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 like we said, currently there's nothing uh, on the horizon within the foreseeable future. But if this COVID situation um, is going to continue for, an, uh, for a considerable time still, and it seems to be the case, I think our legislature will have to look into our current measures as well. But from my side, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Niti, and thank you uh, very much for everyone who participated. Thank you also to uh, my co-panelists, uh, 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 Professor Collitz and uh, Dr. Levenstein. Okay, so from my side, um, as I said, I think whatever we embark on, keep it simple, um, avoid that implementation gap. I think it is it's, it's extremely important that uh, communication um, takes place, that um, consultation takes place. I feel very strongly about policy development um, as opposed to just implementation of legislation or parachuting any specific regulation or uh, statutory um, uh, framework into a specific country. Um, I do also feel very strongly about capacity that should be linked to any law reform process. In so much as I even feel that your capacity development and build, building exercise should precede the law reform process um, as a risk um, evaluation uh, uh, tool. And then um, at the end of the day, uh, it's Friday, I'm feeling very good moment because my team won the Premier League last night. So I'm going to end off my conversation with a quote that I always use. And for some reason now, it is very relevant. Um, it's a quote from J.R.R. Tolkien, and it says that from the ashes, a fire shall be woken, a light from the shadows shall spring. So with that idea um, and that message, thank you everybody that um, that listened um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Niti, for your invitation. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, just from my side, very briefly, I know we're running out of time. I think from a practice perspective, Dr. Niti, we're going to see more South African companies going through distress. It's tough times, but I think the upside and the silver lining is for companies to downsize, resize, and reset. And I think if most companies across the globe have that attitude, we can get some positivity out of what we've been through. And then the last, the last aspect is that I think you've got to keep your stakeholders very close. You need to keep your creditors close, talk to them, explain to them why you're going through the financial distress that you're going through. And I think if you work together, um, 
you can see the other side of a restructuring. So again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Niti and the organization for inviting me and my colleagues uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. Are you still there, Eric? Yeah, I have been always arguing that business rescue has to be thought differently and not necessarily within the insolvency laws. Uh, suspension of fresh filing, uh, moratorium over the assets of the companies, uh, you know, uh, undergoing stress uh, has always made us think that what could be the way outside the insolvency regime. And I think it's right time to think about that. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you our viewers. Uh, you know we have a very dedicated viewers for these webinars. Uh, small cohort of those who are very uh, you know interested, and uh, the the recording for this session will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, we will be sending a mail to all our viewers with the link, and also we will be shortly displaying the discussions in the form of a report. Stay tuned to the IICA website, which is www.iica.in and all the reports get uploaded there and in the end i would uh, i really would like to express my gratitude to the panelists and the team at isca which includes mr abhijit from it ms purvishi shahi and mr lalit from the center for insolvency and bankruptcy and um, i i would like to the end just share one thing that uh, professor boring dr livingston and professor khalid I see this as just a beginning of a great relationship that we will have uh, the center intends to establish with you. And uh, Indian insolvency law is, uh, is uh, recent. We need experts like you to come and discuss so that we can find homegrown solutions for the problems that we have in India. Thank you so much. It was a total delight listening to all of you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We may wish to uh, thank you. Out of the house. Oh, well.